Good day, a very warm welcome to our fantastic audience. I'm Judy van Heuklem from BHP Singapore, and I'm your moderator for this discussion on Militar, the unsung hero of trade digitalization. Together with me here today, we have Thomas Bage, uh, CEO of Digital Container Shipping Association, and Sean Edwards, head of legal at SMBC. Sean is also a chairman at the International Trade and Forfeiting Association. Gentlemen, thank you so much for offering your time uh, and, and experience uh, on this very important legal reform uh, on this topic that we'll be covering today. Uh, before we jump to questions, uh, I would like to offer a word of warning. I'm very passionate about uh, this topic, so please expect me to chip in. Uh, in sharing some of the corporate experience. But maybe let's first set the scene. Uh, so despite technological advancements in 2021, we are still operating in a world where antiquated legal frameworks do not consistently recognize electronic trade documents. Tech alone is not enough and enabling legal reform is really long overdue. So last year, uh, Usatro champions were sitting here on that virtual cyber stage. And at that point, only Bahrain had adopted Militar. Fast forward one year, and we are really delighted with the momentum and progress in this regard. Uh, today, we'd like to bring to the audience some of the perspectives uh, from across the trade ecosystem, uh, as well as we would like to uh, well, discuss the, the meaning of that law uh, and where to from here, very importantly. So maybe uh, I'll start from reflecting on our digitalization journey at BHP and, and broader mining and commodity industry uh, and, and highlight some of the tangible benefits uh, we are after. So we've been on a digitalization journey uh, for over the decade now. We've been actively exploring how we can make the transition to paperless trade. Uh, and how we, we've not been shying away from looking at emerging technologies, like for example, blockchain for support. Uh, but we'd like, I'd like to be really clear here that technology alone is uh, just a fraction of the solution. Uh, because connecting global trade will not happen if we don't solve for technical interoperability, interoperability, but even more so for legal interoperability. And it's the latter, the legal framework, uh, that is much more complex to implement across all the countries and industries. Yet, uh, this long overdue legal reform has billions of dollars of business case behind it, uh, which is what's left on the table today. So now, uh, let me briefly summarize what made us uh, at BHP to embark on this journey uh, in the first place. So getting documents to our customers, our banks is a very slow process. In fact, increasing uh, regulatory attention is something what uh, ma makes it more complex, fragmented and really paper heavy. So the primary drivers for us today are, first of all, fulfilling those growing regulatory and co compliance obligations. Secondly, it's making the documentation transfer more efficient. And it's also uh, making life of our customers and our own people easier. And in the process, it's also about mitigating risks. It's also about bringing resilience and allowing for building back better while we recover from COVID-19 disruption. So those are the primary drivers uh, for BHP to, to eagerly jump uh, and, and understand how we can uh, leverage this, this legal reform. But now, uh, maybe let me turn to Sean. Um, in the center of our conversation today, it's MILITAR. Let me unpack that acronym the model law on electronic transferable records. As a lawyer, can you simplify for us what that legal reform actually means uh, and what's behind the promise? Yeah, so uh, I mean, Melissa, so you've given the acronym model law for electronic transferable records is, is the latest in a long line of UNCTRA, United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, 
answer trial laws on e-commerce. And they started around 20 years ago with a very basic law around uh, around e-commerce, basically allowing uh, e-business to happen and uh, very importantly, also allowing for electronic signatures. And there's been a succession of these laws over the last 20 years. It's interesting that the latest iteration in this process is around transferable records because the other laws are very foundational. They allow sort of equivalence of of electronic with uh, with the real world, if you like, with the, with the physical world, with allowing e-commerce to happen, with uh, with removing um, legal uh, restrictions on e-commerce and e-signatures. And now, of course, as they started as the, as, the, as a foundation, and you see the and you see these model laws reflected in a number of national laws or or, or local law or, or regional laws. For example, the uh, the EU EIDAS regulation, which uh, governs uh, elect uh, electronic signatures, uh, you'll see echoes of some of the e-commerce, uh, the unsustainable e-commerce laws in that. So it's provided a very good foundation and sort of menu for the rest of the world. Now, we now get to electronic transferable records. Why is there this focus on transferable records? And the reason for that is that they are so critical to global trade. So for us, and Thomas will speak, I'm sure, more about this from the DCSA point of view. There's three basic instruments that we're talking about here, and there are some others as well that can be caught. I mean, the, the definition is very wide, but the three basic ones, bills of lading, bills of exchange, and promissory notes. So the last two are, um, are, 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 are financial instruments. The first one is used for finance, is used to, as, a, as a trigger point for finance, but also, of course, very importantly, Give security as it, um, it allows the holder to actually to actually possess the goods that are under the bill of lading. Um, so the um, the important thing here is that, and the characteristic that all of these have is that they are they are negotiable, they're transferable. That's to say, currently in the paper world, if you have that piece of paper and you and you own it, you own either the title, to it, the, the the right to to claim. The unconditional payment in the case of a bill of exchange or a or a promissory note or to claim the goods in the case of a bill of lading and at the moment that is that is the achilles heel of all of this so this this system that's worked for centuries if not millennia uh, is based on actual possession of a real thing a physical thing which is paper at the moment and uh in the in the current in the current digital world of course that means that there's a lot of inefficiency um, there is, uh, there's, as, as you're pointing out, from your experience at BHP, um, you know, there's a loss of speed, there's extra costs and so on. So we have to move um, the the legal world. And here, really, it is a case. I'm a lawyer, as you said. Um, it's a little bit shameful for me as a lawyer to say that the lawyers really lagged behind the technology because the technology to do all of these things has been around really for some time. And it's, it's you know, it's blockchain, but it's also other things. Um, it's actually really relatively straightforward. The bills of lading community um, has moved uh, has moved forward a bit more quickly, but they've had to uh, basically implement a workaround, which is to have these rule books. So the main um, the main uh, e bills of lading providers they all have um, effectively you know a, a rule book. Um, uh, everybody in effect has to sign up to a contract to agree that the e bill of lading is valid. And of course, the problem there, of course, is, is, is the weakest link point that you only need one person uh, in that chain to not uh, you know, to not accept or not be able to uh, to deal digitally uh, and the whole thing falls apart. So what we need is something that can uh, that can span all of these docu uh, all of these documents um, and can apply to everybody. So it, it's got to be it's got to work for bankers. It's got to work for ports. It's got to work for customs authorities. It's got to work for everyone. Um, and Melita has been, you know, incredibly influential in that. So over the last really two years, I think it's four or five years since it was first drafted, and it had a very slow pickup. We're now seeing this accelerating quite a lot. The G7 uh, wrote in support, um, as you said, um, uh, Bahrain um, adopted it. They were the first nation to adopt it, but it's now been adopted by Singapore, very important regionally, of course. They use that essentially as the basis of new laws to change their existing law. Um, it's been adopted by ADGM, uh, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, which is an important uh, local jurisdiction. Um, that's something it uh, um, played a, uh, a big role in. Um, 
it's being looked at by um, very seriously by a number of South American countries. Uh, in the UK, which of course is critical from a legal point of view, uh, we've got a slightly different process. It's, uh, it's not going to be an adoption of Melita. It's uh, a change of the law in a way that is consistent with Melita. That's something that ITFA and actually the ICC as well have been working on for some time. Uh, we are very hopeful that we will get um, legislation uh, in place um, sometime in spring um, of next year. So that was it. It will not be Melita, but it will have it will have the same effect as Melita, and that will be really important. So that's what you know the legal reform is about. Um, it's a foundational point. Um, I think we'll probably talk later on about you know all the possibilities of networks and and so on. But without legal validity, you can't move forward. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean, for, for that. Absolutely, lots of uh, what you just discussed resonates, uh, especially that concept of digital island. Uh, we are living through it. Uh, maybe we can come back to it in a moment. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, let me turn to Thomas. Uh, so, Thomas, can you introduce to our audience the role that the CSA plays uh, and maybe talk to uh, how your members are viewing those legislative changes? Uh, Potentially, if you could give us also some tangible examples of actions uh, that are being taken by the CSA uh, and your partners. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Of course, um, yeah, TCSA is an as association that's established of uh, nine of the world's 10 largest uh, container shipping companies. Um, and given uh, our membership base, we represent somewhere in between 70 to 80 percent of, of the world's containerized trade. Um, our mission uh, is to create a digital foundation for international trade. And we do that with uh, the, of course, with a starting point in the businesses of our, of our members, namely the, the container shipping lines. Uh, we founded DCSA, or they founded rather DCSA in 2019. And, and DCSA operates as a non profit uh, company um, where all of our work is published open source. Uh, for any participant in, in, his, in international trade to pick up and use free of charge. Um, so about the, uh, about the legislative uh, changes that we're seeing, uh, our members are very supportive of uh, Mediator and uh, they are for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, by, uh, by having a uniform legislative uh, framework uh, for, for electronic trade, they will be able to significantly improve the the customer experience uh, that, that that they have uh, that they currently have right now uh, international trade is complex it's unnecessarily complex and and a common legal framework will help simplify uh, the, the the customer experience i also think from a, 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 a a customs point of view or a, a regulator point of view uh, authorities it will also help uh, the communications with uh, with many parties uh, around the world and of, of course also heighten uh, data quality secondly uh, a good point outside the customer experiences is, is to mention the, uh, uh, the the big drive that the uh, that everybody has now to get to a, a zero, zero zero carbon footprint um, because today a lot of what's taking place in terms of trade documentation is that trade documents are, are printed, um, they are transported all over um, cities, um, and they are air freighted all over the world. Um, and that's of course not good for, for the environment. Uh, and again, adopting a, uh, let's say a, a common framework, legal framework for this will allow us to uh, surely, uh, slowly maybe, but surely uh, doc, uh, uh, shift from paper documents into electronic documents, whether it is the, uh, the, the papers that Sean mentioned, promissory notes, uh, bill of exchange, or, or the bill of lading, or it's some of the other uh, documents, the letters of credit, the uh, export and import permits and, and packing lists and so on. It will all have to become digital. And then maybe thirdly, and I think sometimes underestimated, that is that, uh, that innovation will start to happen from here. Right now, um, we don't see a lot of innovation happening because we're locked in a legal, um, uh, in a deadlock where uh, paper documents are required. And, and there's so much more we can do if it all starts to become digital. And I'm quite sure we will see when we look back at this conversation, maybe five or 10 years from now, we will be able to see that a lot, uh, a lot of new business model have, 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 have come up as a consequence of that. You asked uh, a little bit about um, uh, 
um, the, the tangible results. Um, or maybe I should say, well, when, when I say this thing about supporting uh, Melita, I, I do think that the important thing also to mention here is that it is implemented in a harmonized manner and not in ways that, that cause, uh, let's say, extra complexities uh, to the participants in international trade. I think we've all seen that sometimes with some of the, 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 the good intention, um, maybe uh, uh, EU custom single window, uh, which uh, was implemented in many different ways across the member states, and and it actually it wasn't a it was a step forward, but it wasn't a great step forward. So I think let's let's keep the implementation in place uh, or, or in mind when, as we go forward. But some of the tangible actions uh, you asked about, um, DCSA works across a number of themes, and maybe not all equally relevant for for the conversation of of. Uh, um, of, of today, but but let me mention a few of them. We work uh, across the vessel journey that is typically optimizing port calls, uh, lowering cost, and making the the uh, the logistics chain uh, more uh, more efficient and effective. Uh, we work across the um, equipment journey, and here we are specifically talking about interoperability and creating an interoperable ecosystem for the use of smart containers, whereby containers will be able to communicate with each other and, and the vessels that they're loaded on with with, with rail providers, truck, trucks and so on when they are on land. And then uh, very importantly uh, for, for this conversation today, we work across documentation journey. And here, I think probably the biggest thing that we uh, that we are working on right now is electronic documentation, which is essentially taking the bill of lading uh, uh, from from a paper based version into a digital version, and then moving on with the rest of uh, with the rest of the papers. Um, but maybe Judy, uh, uh, BHP is a major shipper. So uh, so what are some of the the challenges you are encountering in in, in your journey? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think probably the the key challenge here was to best describe in the statistics that recently the uh, Law Commission in the UK shared in their briefing is the four billion of paper documents that uh, are serving international trade today and fueling and behind that international trade. So that's really the quintessence of it. Uh, but I think well, if we if we zoom down to our journey of 10 years, uh, and maybe for the purpose of this discussion, uh, let me pick just two, uh, two, two of the key impediments to focus on. Uh, firstly, it's certainly that lack of legislation uh, uh, that is recognizing digital trade documentation. So electronic documents today uh, don't have the equal status with paper documents in many jurisdictions and quite often the paper documents are still required. Uh, and secondly, it's also well, uh, in your space, uh, Thomas, the lack of uh, global standards to drive interoperability, really. So this makes exchange of information very difficult uh, and creates that fragmentation and complexity because we don't have those standards today. Uh, so, so I guess the derivative of those two really comes to a slow adoption of existing solutions. Uh, and maybe it's worth to really add that that slow adoption is across the entire ecosystem. Uh, our customers, uh, also banks uh, and, and the shipping industry. So all the actors have a role to play here. Uh, but maybe let me take it a step farther and share that the platforms that we are using today uh, usually have a very specific uh, focus. So it's e-documentation and nothing else, or it's uh, vessel tracking uh, and not much more than that. But to really be able to orchestrate the entire post-trade flow, uh, those platforms really need to talk to each other and seamlessly connect in and securely exchange data, uh, provide that superior user experience that you spoke about uh, Thomas. Uh, yeah, so it's really that lack of robust legal framework that uh, coming back to the topic of digital islands that gives birth to those. So what are those digital islands? I think uh, uh, Sean very well described that already uh, earlier in the conversation. Uh, it means that 
all the participants in the transaction need to sign up to the same rulebook uh, and be aligned on the same platform. So imagine importers, exporters, vessel owners, agents, banks, and so on. Uh, so it works perfectly for a pilot, but when you uh, start thinking of scaling it across multiple transactions, uh, then you go to other commodities, different buyers, uh, geographies, uh, well, entire global trade. You, you get the picture. That's 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 very difficult to make it work. Uh, so this is really where our hopes behind Militar sit. Uh, so really in 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 giving that uh, same uh, recognition to uh, electronic documents, which today I would say are discriminated. Uh, as well as the functional equivalence, meaning the ease of switching to paper, paper convert, and so on. Quite often we need the flexibility in transactions. Uh, and, and, and today it requires quite some creativity uh, to be able to execute it. Uh, and well, the, the, the third uh, hope that we have is really in the uh, neutrality of technology. So being able to support the technologies as they evolve and support that innovation that uh, you spoke about, uh, Thomas and, uh, and, and Sean touched on it as well. So it's really being able to uh, implement and consume those technologically advanced solutions as they start, uh, as they start coming to life, as they start evolving and democratizing that access to reliable, high quality, trusted data. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, maybe let me move now back to Sean uh, and ask uh, around the banks. So what do you think this legal reform will do for the banks? Will it really speed up the adoption of uh, digital trades? Uh, and can corporates now uh, really feel that uh, will be supported on the journey? Yeah, so I mean, as I as I said earlier on, having legal validity and, and having a you made a very important point that it needs to be harmonised. Or Thomas made it needs to be harmonised, and that's the whole point about about Melita that we have the same set of ingredients, if you like, the same set of wording for the whole world. Um, as UK, as I said, is taking a slightly different approach, but it will be equivalent to the same thing. Um, but to answer your question, Judy, um, it, there's actually quite a few things uh, in that. So. Um, Firstly, you know the foundational aspects can back. Is it, is it legally valid? That without that, you, you you don't move forward at all. But when that happens, and I say when, not if, because I'm a very optimistic person, and there is a lot there's a lot of movement at the moment. Um, so when when that happens, what does that mean for um, you know for the offerings that that banks will have for people like you? And by the way, you are one of our one of our customers on one of these platforms. Um, so. The banks actually, and this is, I think, the first point I want to make. The banks themselves actually are not, um, in a way, the uh, they're, they're certainly not the people who create the technology. Um, and I think there was a debate some years ago about whether the fintechs were going to take over the, you know, uh, take over from the banks. I think the pandemic has shown that actually they that that that's not possible. They don't actually have the capital to do that. Um, but in any event, the bank fintech uh, cooperation model is really where it's at at the moment. So the banks are cooperating uh, with fintechs to either create um, white labeled platforms or integrate the, um, th their technology, or they're moving onto the platforms uh, being provided by some of the bigger tech, uh, but some, some of the bigger tech uh, providers in this space. Um, and I know you are on one of them where we, where we deal with you. Now, the question there is, uh, and this is the, the second point I want to make, is um, how is this all going to happen? Uh, so legally it can happen. How is it practically going to happen? Are we going to get uh, 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 an open ecosystem where essentially there's a lot of different providers? There's, um, you know, It's not like uh, Microsoft and Apple. There's actually a dozen people providing essentially you know, your, you know, uh, your, uh, your computer software. Are we going to have... That sort of uh, that sort of environment, that open system, um, or are we going to move to a couple of couple of the big platforms? So a sort of uh, monopoly or near monopoly. Now the, the benefit of that, and there's big downsides, of course, is that you get standardization de facto commercially very quickly. So if everybody uses, uses platform A 
or platform B, you've you've got standardization and whatever the rules are um, for those platforms, they'll be understood by everybody and everybody can use it. Um, the downside is, of course, that that might stifle some innovation. Um, it might lead to, you know, to, 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 to competition issues. Um, it might lead to a situation where actually pricing um, does not come down, actually, uh, that pricing increases because you've got uh, because you've got a monopolistic situation. Um, so we're probably going to end up somewhere between, I think, the two. I think it's going to be a much more open and a much more open environment, commercial environment. For that to happen, we, we need integration and we need interoperability. Um, and those are things that uh, all of the big trade finance associations are working on ourselves in ITFA. We have a DDoC standards, um, which is uh, integrated into the DSI, the Digital um, Standards Initiative from ICC, which is headquartered in uh, Singapore, as you know. Um, and we have, um, uh, you know, and we, and, and we will have e easy templates for all the documents we've been talking about t t today. So that's the interoperability bit, if you can get that through the standards. The integration bit, which actually from, and this is what I get from talking to a lot of the fintechs, um, the integ integrating that into a, into a bank's platform um, is actually where they want things to move to. Once it's integrated, it becomes very sticky from their point of view. Um, and integration is actually quite a challenge, in fact, and I'll tell you that from a bank's perspective. Because you need to integrate the, you know, the, the the front end with the middle end and the back end, and that's actually uh, what what a lot of banks are realizing now that they've got these uh, they've got these great technologies, whether it's a platform or individual providers, but they need to bring it all together. And so standards help you to have a common language. You still need to integrate, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that. So. To go back to the question you originally answered, when will we have a solution uh, for people like BHP? Um, I think the banks are still working out what the best way is to do that. And I, my, my, my sense of it is that uh, we're still a, f a few years away from, from that for, for the reasons I've given, integration and interoperability. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. Hopefully it won't be another decade, <laughs> but I do appreciate uh, it's going to take time. Not a decade, I think, <laughs> but yeah, it, it isn't around the corner. Uh, Thomas, we spoke about uh, that interoperability already. Uh, I, I spoke about it uh, or it came in, uh, in my call-outs a few times and uh, similarly, uh, Sean was now uh, bringing the topic of interoperability integration. Uh, would be interested to hear what does that mean to the CSA? How do you interpret interoperability? Is that something of importance uh, for you as well? Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> I think it's a, it's probably the quintessential question. Um, it, it is, it, it is really at the at the foundation of what we do. And I, I I've often used uh, comparison to other industries because I think that actually helps jog our. Um, our argumentation and, and our um, and our conversations about why is it we need interoperability. Um, you know, our, we all run around with mobile phones, and of course, uh, you know, my Apple phone calls your Samsung phone, and uh, we also have, all have email systems. And if I use a Mac email system, I can still send to somebody using Google or Outlook because there is interoperability, even though it's built differently. And the same thing is the is going to be the case uh, when it comes to international trade documents. Um, Forty percent, according to our, our uh, according to our members, uh, and it varies member by member naturally, but up to um, somewhere in between thirty five and forty percent of all bills of lading, they require a a change in um, uh, uh, a change of title at some point in time. And that's quite significant when you look at the amount of bill of ladings that are used in, internet, in, in international trade. So either uh, we, there will be, as Sean was pointing to, there will be a few platforms and all the players will be in those platforms uh, talking to the, uh, to the same party sitting at the other end using that platform, or you will create interoperability. And I'm quite sure that uh, there will be interoperability uh, as I said, we have it in all other parts of our lives, so why wouldn't we have it when it comes to international trade? 
uh, I don't think any customer exper uh, customer will will accept to say, well, when I get this shipment, I will have to log into uh, this system over here, and when I get uh, a shipment from another person, I'll need to use that system there. Why would you? You want that integrated into your backend, and therefore I think interoperability is key. And I think maybe just to hammer that point in. What about regulators? Do we expect the customs organizations to sit and log into the different systems? No, of course they won't. They want to have the data coming into their, their targeting systems and that, therefore it needs to be interoperable. So I think um, I, I, I definitely see this as uh, you know, a very uh, foundational uh, uh, a point that, that we get interoperability. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think. Uh... Uh, we are all quite aligned here, very important topic uh, and real enabler. Uh, in the meantime, I'm looking here at the questions coming from the audience and probably the most important one uh, is around the benefits. So maybe if we could take a round of thoughts uh, and, and share on some of the benefits that we are seeing from the banking community, uh, benefits behind Militer uh, and similarly for uh, the members and partners of the CSA. Sean, would you like to uh, reflect on some of the benefits? Yeah, so I, I'm actually opening up. So, so there's been a couple of really interesting studies done about uh, about the benefits of digitization of the instruments we're talking about, um, both to um, in the UK and actually um, it's just about to come out to uh, to, to in, in the G7. So talking about the um, about the benefits uh, to uh, the benefits of doing um, of, of digitizing. So um, it's actually really quite enormous. Um, so in the UK, for example, ICC and have carried out a study for UK SMEs and just looking. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking over the figures here, uh, but just to, so just for one just for one well, one, one large um, country, but. Um, you know, if we if we're able to digitize the documents that we're talking about, we reckon it's going to be 25 billion pounds of new economic growth that would be that would be generated by that. And and that's a contribution of one billion to the international trade gap, which uh, you probably uh, have heard has, uh, has 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 gone up. So that's just um, that's just in the UK in uh, for the G7. Um, the 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 the, the extra uh, exports that we reckon uh, the ICC reckon actually will be generated by 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 full digitization is six trillion dollars. It's absolutely enormous. So the benefits are uh, and you know that so that's that's extra uh, that's extra exports. The, um, the 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 benefit for banks directly is a reduction in. Uh, uh, in the uh, in in, in uh, operating time, um, so um, th they reckon here that sort of compliance times would, would fall from an average of two point three days to less than half a day. So really, I mean, you know, these are projections based on estimates from from economists and so on. Um, but the, you know, the benefits are absolutely are absolutely enormous. Um, but it can only happen. And I, I really want to reiterate this: this can only happen if. This is all joined up globally. That's the the promise of Melita, at least on on the foundational aspects, and then of course, the networks and the the ecosystem, the commercial ecosystem we've talked about. But it's all there, sort of waiting to happen. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. Uh, team sport. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't get to the benefits, but it's really worth it. Uh, so we can hear the business case uh, is is enormous. Uh, anything you would like to add to, to those benefits uh, and reflections from your end, Thomas? Um, yeah, just, just just a few things. Uh, I mean, obviously, I already mentioned the customer experience, but I but I do think that it is about time we take international trade into the 21st century um, and, and bring in a customer experience that's on par with what we see in other industries, whether it's banking, it's telco, it's media, it's retail. So I do think that there's an there's an enormous uh, potential uh, simply by simplifying some some of the the ways of working in in in, in uh, international trade. Um, I won't talk too much about the US dollar uh, amount, but but clearly from from our members, we also see a vast uh, opportunity in terms of doing things more efficiently um, uh, when it comes to uh, simply not. Uh, 
transporting paper around. And that points to the last one, which I think is a, a certainly it's a growing, uh, I live in Northern Europe and everything uh, uh, is very much hung up on uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, and, uh, and carbon footprint and so on. And I do think that there's also an element of this as we are going towards a, a, zero, uh, a zero carbon target in, in, in 2050, then we also need to look at this. And, and, and that's why uh, having the uh, Melita as, as a foundation, as a, as a legal framework for doing this is absolutely essential. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more. Uh, so it's a few things indeed. Uh, on the surface, indeed, faster and more efficient uh, transactions. So no paper, no courier, less errors. Uh, but there is so much more to it, right? It's not only about the reduction of costs because of the uh, faster processing and, and handling of the documentation, but it's really about all those other opportunities like improved security, better visibility, uh, being able to audit those trades, uh, and all that brings really the transparency to transactions and to markets overall, and, 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 and that's enormously valuable. And of course, the effects of decarbonization and being able to uh, bring some ESG reporting uplifts across the entire supply chain, that's, that's, that's the promise that, uh, and that's the benefit that we are really uh, after here and really, really looking, looking into it. But uh, as, as we are wrapping up the conversation, uh, maybe I would like to uh, just invite you uh, to share the final, final remarks, uh, something we haven't maybe quite yet covered in the conversation and you would like to call out uh, at, this, at this final moment. So I think integration is really important. So you know we spend we spend a lot of time on this on, on in this discussion talking about um, you know the the le the, le the legal um, foundational aspects and talking about interoperability. And I did call it out earlier, but I just want to emphasise integration because it, all of this will be available very soon. Um, the problem is, and it goes back a little bit to the question you are asking me, um, is that unless the, the the people who could actually provide this are ready to do it um it's not going to happen and it's so, so all the work that we've done here all the work that the lawyers at unser trial that different legislatures have done this will all be for nothing or not for nothing but it won't it won't produce the results that we want quickly enough unless all of this is integrated and um, and that is from a very practical perspective that's the problem that i'm seeing at the moment um so it's okay to have this, but it's like, you know, when you move from your old mobile phone to your smartphone, but on a much, much bigger scale. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Sean, for that reflection. Uh, Thomas. I think the last thing for me would, would simply be ask, uh, to ask uh, the participants in, in, in the international trade to lean in. Um, there's... Uh, um, one could, of course, sit and wait for this to happen, but we need somebody to to come first. Uh, we need to transform the uh, uh, to tra transform international trade, and and that's best done by having some significant players leaning in and contributing and becoming part of the the solutions. Uh, so, so I that that would be on a closing note for me. Uh, that, that I would say I would encourage people to lean in and come to the table and help us craft this. Thanks for that. I think from my end, if I was to add just one thing, I think it would really be around uh, helping to make unfamiliar more familiar. So really about sharing that best practice and education that we uh, still need in that space. So really educating about the benefits, uh, talking about those business cases. Not everyone might be quite yet there, even though they are really, really attractive. Uh, but understanding the why and then the how as well. Uh, so I think this is where we will end our conversation today. So let me just thank you for today. Thomas, Sean, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, Judy.